Hudlin Berg, I'm a senior fellow here at the Thank Hudson you. Institute, and welcome to our discussion this afternoon. We are joined by Corey Shockey, now the Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, uh, late of the uh, Hoover Institution, as indeed am I. Uh, and we're going to talk about, among other things, this wonderful book from Harvard University Press, Safe Passage, the Transition from British to American Hegemony. Uh, which I think if anybody gives it so much of a, as a second thought, um, has tremendous policy relevance in the current environment, and we'll talk about that too. We'll also try to talk a little bit about what's going on with the much-wanted U.S.-U.K. special relationship, where it stands, where it's going, how things like Brexit, like Trump administration, have had an, uh, an effect on it, and where that will be going. So we're going to try to keep this very conversational up on, uh, up on the front of the podium here. And uh, you know, there's a convention, actually, as I have learned from many years of uh, being on panels uh, and uh, conducting exercises like the one we are engaged in today. And the convention is that the people on the panel or up at the front act like they are old and dear friends. <laughs> They, Are we going to do that? Well, they, they, they <laughs> laugh at each other's jokes all the time. They, you know, they, it's, it's full of bonhomie. It's, generally speaking, artificially generated, et cetera. But actually, Corey and I are, are quite close friends. <laughs> so we, I don't know. Maybe we should just dial it down or, or, or well, in any case. Um, we are such close friends that Todd Lindbergh told me honestly that the first draft of this book wasn't any good. And that is something that most people who aren't your friends won't do for you. And it is not only a better book because Todd did it, it's a published book because Todd did it. <laughs> well, you give me too much credit. But, um, but I th I, one thing, I, Corey actually was nice enough to put pretty much exactly what she just said into the acknowledgment section, the acknowledgments which I think is going to be terrific because it's going to deter other people from sending me their books to, <laughs> to review. <laughs> Uh, because if I'm such a ruthless taskmaster, they may, they may not want to hear it. <laughs> but let's uh, let's set a little bit of the historical uh, predicate here. And do we need to set a conceptual predicate here? What is this hegemony of which you speak? So the hegemon of the international order isn't always the richest country. It isn't always the strongest country. It's the country that sets and enforces the rules. Right. So that's what a hegemon is. Okay. And um, in across time, there are, there's only one example of the dominant power, the rule giver of the international order, voluntarily, without violence, giving that place up to another country. And that's the transition that I was interested in and writing about in this book. All right. Well, now, you set this up not so much as a kind of um, complete narrative history of the period in question, but in terms of uh, a number of key episodes that actually mark the in what you call the inflection points in the in the transition, why don't we just start at the beginning with those and uh, and 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 take us through this transition a little bit? Okay, so I, as Todd said, I didn't try and write a a, a narrative. What I tried to do was pick the points in time where the US attempted to assert different rules and looked at the choices the two governments made. So what did the British do in response? When did the balance shift in the relationship? And what were the choices available to each government? And what did they choose to do? The nine points in time I look at are the Monroe Doctrine, which many of you probably know, was actually a British proposal to the United States for us to do jointly to prevent colonial, to prevent continental European powers from colonizing the Americas. And it's the first instance in which the US really challenges the existing order. So if you think about the earlier, the two wars we have with Britain, right, the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, in both of those instances, the United States was asking Britain to enforce the rules it had already established, right? To treat American colonists as English citizens with all the rights and privileges. And in the case of the War of 1812, not to impress American sailors for the British war effort without respecting their nationality. What starts happening with the Monroe Doctrine in 1823 is the US starts asserting we're different, 
we have a right to different rules than you have already established. And you see it in the Monroe Doctrine where Britain um, gets what it wants by another means. That is, they persuade the French not to uh, support the Spanish and, and Portuguese in trying to have a reconquista of, of the American continents. You see it in the Oregon Boundary Crisis in 1854, where when James K. Polk was elected president, he campaigned for president on a platform of not just fighting Mexico, but also fighting Britain over the Oregon boundary, which is the, which Oregon, what is now Oregon, Washington, Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana was jointly administered territory by both Britain and the United States. And the only reason that worked was because nobody lived there. And once you start having American, Americans streaming across the Oregon Trail and living in the West, it becomes a source of real friction. What's interesting about it, though, is that it's not so much the territorial dispute between the two countries, but the way the Polk administration asserts that Britain has no right to represent citizens in the Oregon territories because Britain's not a democracy. So what the United States does in the Oregon boundary crisis is assert that what the rules should be would have overturned the British order. That is, no government that does not have a consensual relationship with its citizens has any right to represent them. Just in case anybody was thinking that this whole democracy business is something we're new to, <laughs> it's actually a thorn in the side of many uh, of our friends for quite some time. Absolutely. And what's so, what was for me, um, just to, to divert from the chronology for a minute, what was mm. for me so interesting about this case is that now we think of Britain and the United States as so similar. We think of ourselves as similar culturally, politically, coming from a common uh, Renaissance political history. That's not what Britain and the United States look like to each other before about 1875. So, you know, in the period in which we're talking, uh, we don't have this sort of affinity. In fact, I imagine there are also some rather hard feelings about the loss of the <laughs> recent colonies. Uh, and so well, the affinity is something that actually starts developing only much later. But talk us up into that period a little bit, too. Uh, so the third inflection point I look at in the book was, is the question that actually started me looking at the case, which was, why didn't the British recognize the Confederacy? during the American Civil War. The US was, as Benjamin Disraeli said at the time, beginning to cast lengthening shadows across the Atlantic. Uh, Prime Minister Palmerston was so virulently anti-American that he, serious, he actually writes Queen Victoria about his desire to, to cast a blow that would definitively disunite the Americas. Because if that could happen in conjunction with Mexico becoming a successful monarchy, Britain could have no better circumstance. And yet they don't do it. And it's my favorite um, piece of the book because what restrained the dominant power of the international order from doing something that it believed was in its interest was who we are as a political culture as an immigrant society with broad political participation. Britain, Palmerston was partly looking to uphold the rules of order, that is blockade was a useful tool for Britain. But what really decided him was he worried so much that who the United States is was so attractive as, a, as an inspiration to Britain's own population that, that choosing to work against the Union would redound into Britain's domestic political uh, decisions about expanding the franchise and about the ability to control Ireland and Scotland. Um, so, you know, we tend to think of America's polyglot nationality as a vulnerability in a time of war, right? Think about the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. But in fact, in the most important case where damage could have been done to us, who we were as an immigrant society was a, a source of enormous strength 
And I think that for me was the sweetest thing that I figured out as I was writing the book. So that's the American Civil War. The next inflection point I look at in the book is not a crisis, but it's the way in the 1870s, both Britain and the United States choose the national mythology that defines them. For the US, it's the conquest of the American West, right? It's how we knit ourselves together after the Civil War. Um, and the, the, the sense of limitless horizon coupled with pervasive risk. And we think about ourselves as, as brave and conquering. That is, we think about ourselves in imperial terms as a result of westward expansion. And at the same time, Britain begins to celebrate itself as a culture that expands the political franchise gradually, peacefully, and in ways that minimize the social upheaval. So Britain becomes a democracy and America becomes an empire in a time frame where we are pulling abreast of them, to use uh, John Quincy Adams' phrase for it. And that means that we look similar to each other and different from everybody else in the international order. And that's what creates the space for political compromise and crises that, that come subsequently. So, so at the start of this story, Britain thought of itself as a liberal government that wasn't democratic. And they thought of the United States as a democracy that was corrupt, turbulent, unpredictable, uh, right? They didn't want to be us, and we didn't want to be them. By the 1870s, and just to give you one cultural fingerprint of how deep that animosity went, Charles Dickens, the novelist, made a tour of the United States and describes America <laughs> as a society more barbaric than the Indian nations it conquered, right? Uh, a British travel writer, G. Lowe's Dickinson, writing in 1870, describes the, says that fundamentally he understands two things about the United States, that irrevocably, irrevocably America is the future, and second, that fundamentally it is a barbaric society. Right? By the 1870s, those edges soften as you have the end of slavery, uh, you have the um, Britain feeling less fearful of change, but also in some ways um, uh, no longer thinking of itself as a dynamic and innovative society. Right? The people who, who bring us the Industrial Revolution in the 1870s start to embrace an almost pastoral um, mythologizing of themselves. So that, that kind of sets the stage for what will be the great power competition between Britain and the United States because the US comes roaring out of the Civil War with productive capacity and, and all those good things. The moment at which the tables turn comes in 1895 during an obscure crisis over Venezuela repudiating its debts. Um, and it, said, it was for me such a tantalizing case because Grover Cleveland, the president of the United States, was so ardently opposed to America as an imperial power that he refused to proceed with the annexation of Hawaii. And yet he becomes the first American president to enforce the Monroe Doctrine, and he enforces it against Britain. Um, in the course of the Venezuelan debt crisis, so what happens? Uh, British companies were investing in building railroads and things like that in Venezuela. The next Caudillo who overthrows the previous Caudillo in Venezuela repudiates the debts. There had been a boundary negotiation going on for 45 years between Venezuela and Britain. Um, and it comes to a head in 1895. The British land Marines at the port of Corinto to uh, collect uh, tariffs on goods being brought in and out of the country as a way to regain their, the money Venezuela had uh, taken from them. 
Venezuela, it, it's such a great American story because an American lobbyist employed by the Caudillo of Venezuela agitates in Washington for the U.S. to have to enforce the Monroe Doctrine. And it builds so much momentum through op-eds in the newspapers that Grover Cleveland actually has to deal with this. Somebody who really, really didn't believe in the Monroe Doctrine. And because he ran a kind of cabinet government over which he had relatively loose control, the Secretary of State, Warren Olney, Warren Olney, I can't remember his first name, Secretary of State Olney, takes the bit in his teeth and writes a 12,000 word treatise about, uh, that ends up saying, American law is practically fiat upon this continent. Um, and the British have a choice to make about whether to uh, repudiate the Monroe Doctrine or to agree to it. Cleveland you adroitly uses that best tool of any capable American president, which is the recklessness of the American Congress. Cleveland goes to Congress and gets a unanimous endorsement for war against Great Britain. Uh, Brian McGrath, how many ships were there in the uh, in the Caribbean squadron around that time? I think it was six. I'd have to go back and check. I think it was actually six mm -hmm. ships going up against the Royal Navy, the paramount military force in the world. That's how reckless the United States was as a rising power. And guess what? It actually worked, right? Prime Minister Salisbury, six months after the start of the crisis, gets cheered in the House of Commons for saying there is no greater supporter of the Monroe Doctrine than Her Majesty's government. So what changes over that course of time? Again, it's a beautiful story about free societies. It is actually civil society in Britain and the United States that begins to feel similar to each other. So, um, uh, so Prince Albert, right? American newspapers uh, start a write-in campaign for people, because uh, we're on the brink of war with Great Britain, so they start a write-in campaign. Write a letter to your British counterparts and to your member representatives about why this would be a bad idea. The newspapers are overwhelmed with letters like this. One of them from Prince Albert, uh, saying that war between these two countries would be the equivalent of fratricide. Um, 340 some members of the British Parliament write an open letter to the American to their American congressional counterparts, suggesting that there should always be arbitration of differences between these two countries. Right. So so it creates the space for politicians to back down from their maximalist claims in the crisis. And that's why there's no war between Britain and the United States. And so the other three cases in the book, I'll just uh, tell you what they are. And if you're interested, we can talk about them at greater length. I look at the Spanish-American War, which uh, no less a source than Commodore Dewey believes he could not have succeeded in the Battle of Manila Bay without British help. The British sail their ships into the line where the Germans would have had to fire on them as well as on us. Uh, the Spanish-American War, like the American Civil War, all the attention goes to the Eastern Theater, which in this case is the Caribbean, where the real strategic choices are in the Western Theater, that is the Battle of the Pacific. And I look at World War I as the beginnings of when the US is the dominant power in the relationship and the fear the British have about their reliance on the United States. Uh, recall that by the end of World War I, the United States was contributing 10,000 soldiers a day into the war effort. And so Britain was so heavily reliant on American money, on American equipment, and on American soldiers to break the stalemate on the Western Front. And we're so worried about that reliance that the government actually did an internal study of whether the United States if it shut off assistance, could force Britain to lose the war and concluded that we could. 
Then uh, the, the chapter I wanted to end the book on, which Todd, like other people, objected to, was the Washington Naval Accords of 1923, because I thought that was the moment at which the United States first enforced against Britain a set of rules the British didn't want, which was uh, a proportion of, na so, so what the Washington Treaty treaties were, was the United States trying its hand at naive international negotiations to prevent war. So President, Wilton, President Woodrow Wilson comes home, with the, uh, comes home with the Versailles Agreement and the League of Nations. Americans reject it. His successor, Warren Harding, actually succeeds at the reckless task of pretending you could prevent war and comes up with a set of of proportional naval uh, limits on naval power on battleships. On, uh, and what it serves to do is foster innovation among the American Navy, the Japanese Navy, and to restrain it among Britain. It's, my, it's a really fun case study for how the British the British invested in American power in the time of transition because they believed that once the United States was a great power, we would be a traditional great power. And that proved right in the immediate moment, but it very quickly proved untrue. That is, the United States wasn't comfortable as a traditional great power. It wasn't possible to persuade Americans to care about the world and to shape the international order by behaving as a great power. What we become as we grow more powerful, we grow both more ambitious, but here unique among great powers, we grow more liberal. We try to create an international order that is a macrocosm of our domestic political order where self-determination becomes, uh, and, and liberal trading regimes, and all the things that you know so well, because we've been living with them since World War II. And that's the last case study in the book, because it's the big screen technicolor version of a hegemonic United States. And what the British succeed at in that instance is, uh, is creating a mythology of the special relationship after it has ceased to be special. And not because America likes Britain less or Britain is in any way less deserving, but because the United States actually succeeds in creating an international order in which Britain isn't the only other democracy, isn't the only other country that shares our values. And that's why you see the attenuation of the special relationship. And the closing chapter of the book looks at what might this mean for future hegemonic transitions? As you can see, it's very difficult to interview Corey. Uh, <laughs> so, sorry. No, no. I, I, the, the, I couldn't, I, I, my only interpositions would have been, and then what happened in the course of this? <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's always nice to have um, authors who've not only um, uh, written and read their books, but can remember the contents of them many months after turning them in at the uh, publishers. But so let's, uh, I, I want to visit two areas. One is the coming uh, situation in the Pacific, shall we say. Um, and uh, we're, we may be looking at another hegemonic transition uh, at some point in the, uh, in the future. And what's that going to be like? And what does the British case tell us about that? And then I want to come back to the uh, special relationship stuff, which I've now, uh, you've now informed me is, is a myth of British creation. Uh, and so I think we need, to, we need to spend a little bit more time on that. We can also get your view from London there. But let's, let's, let's look east first. Um, you know, we have, a, we have the United States playing the role of the hegemonic power in the Pacific. We keep the sea lines of communications open. That's our job. We don't appreciate it when people interfere with our uh, ability to do that job and are willing to go to some lengths, uh, including sending aircraft carriers to demonstrate the uh, na free navigability of the high seas, et cetera. Um, Chinese uh, have a different, uh, perhaps, view of, uh, of this situation, but one that is evolving over time. 
And uh, I, I guess uh, the, the short question, the, the, the short version of the question is, uh, since very, there seemed to be very little uh, analogous to the U.S.-Chinese relationship at the present moment uh, with, uh, in, in relation to the uh, U.S.-U.K. relationship, uh, so, um, what's uh, what's what what's in your crystal ball at this particular point? Uh, so, I guess I have three reactions to the question. The first is um, to that everyone should have a healthy dose of concern that any hegemonic transition could be peaceful, because even in the case of Britain and the United States, which by the time the transition occurs. They, they think of themselves in such fundamentally similar terms. Their economies are aligned in ways that are mutually reinforcing. They, they have so much in common. And even in that case, it's a very close run thing that this happens without cataclysmic violence. So I guess my first point is uh, the way to bet your money is always that it will be violent. All right. The, the second reaction I have to the question is, I am skeptical that we that China will continue to rise in a way that will make it a viable contender to American dominance of the international order. Uh, and I'm skeptical for several reasons. One is that uh, the American order, so one difference between the British transition and the American transition is that most countries in the international order prefer the American status quo to what might replace it, right? So there are very, there's very strong stickiness to the existing order because contrary to what gets said a few blocks further down the street from here, um, allies actually are America's enormous advantage. They never do enough, they're tiresome, they're, all those things. And yet, they are the main difference in why the American international order is cost-effective and sustainable, because by and large, people help us sustain it. And the way the Chinese are engaging, certainly in their region, but also beyond it, is building natural antibodies to, to Chinese dominance. You begin to see hedging against a rising China, in a way that the United States has, for the most part, not experienced. Other strong powers have tended to help us not to work against us. Um, the third reason I am skeptical that China can continue um, to become a challenger to the United States is that I actually, so remember that the interview Tony Blair gave during the Iraq war uh, where he was challenged by a British journalist about you know, playing along with America's recklessness. And Blair's answer was, it's even worse than you imagine. I actually believe it. That's where I am about liberal internationalism, right? I realize it's deeply unfashionable to think Frank Fukuyama was onto something with his Hegelian argument about the end of history. But I still think he's right. I do still think good things go together. I do genuinely believe that there is a Maslowian pyramid and that as people's basic needs begin to be taken care of, they grow to be more demanding political consumers. And that nations cannot perpetually, well, just to quote Edmund Burke, the use of force alone is but temporary. It may subdue for a moment, but it does not pre it may subdue for a moment, but it does not prevent the need to enforce in the future. And a nation is not to be governed that must perpetually be conquered. The Chinese government is conquering Chinese society. It's not governing Chinese society. And I am optimistic that Frank Fukuyama and Hegel before him are right that what will challenge the Chinese government is moms demanding safe baby milk from a government too corrupt to reliably produce it. And parents who see elementary schools collapse in earthquakes demanding better of their government. So either this Chinese government will begin to be responsive to its public needs 
in which case it will become a power the United States can easily manage and work in conjunction. It will become a responsible stakeholder of the existing order. Or this Chinese government won't survive. Uh, it will have to invest so many resources in controlling its own society. I do not believe it can have the, the wingspan or the sail to really challenge the United States. My favorite thing ever written about American power in the international order is a magazine piece written by James Fallows around 2002 or so, right when he came back from being the Atlantic correspondent in Beijing. And it's about the role of the Jeremiah in American foreign policy, right? We always think we're failing and that's how we succeed because we're good at fixing our problems. And the declinists, Tom Friedman and company, who think that the United States, you know, we're, we're hopeless because Congress debates things and property rights trump high-speed train routes. Um, forget that on a 10-year time frame, what free societies, and particularly this dynamic, barbaric free society is good at, is solving problems consistent with people's concerns. All right, so it's, a, it's an optimistic view, certainly. Uh, and at, it comes at a time when there's a great deal of pessimism afoot in the land. I think there's a lot more going on in which people are asking questions about the viability of American democracy. Uh, what do you say to them? Uh, one of the real joys of being a historian of the 19th century is that I can assure everybody that we are not newly a country full of crazy people run by reckless politicians. We have always been a country full of crazy people run by reckless politicians. Right? One of my favorite British historians, Bertha Ann Reuter, writes at the turn of the 20th century, turn from the 19th to the 20th century, that Americans are a people too extreme in politics or religion or both to live in peace anywhere else. If you look at the way people react to Andrew Jackson's election in 1828, right? Like it looks like the mob is taking over the country and, and British commentary on it is really bracing and sounds a lot like everybody's commentary now. Uh, so I, and it's not just once in American history that you see this tumult of an, an, an American public sick and tired of the government leading it, of elites like me telling them what's good for them, and they flip the tables over and try something different. That has worked in this country because of the enormous strength and rigor of our democratic institutions, of the, the competing claims that the courts and the Congress and the rambunctious free media in our society bring to the table to constrain those forces. But it's also because of the federalist structure that allows you know, the superintendent of the Sonoma School Board to decide what gets taught in elementary school. The diversity of our country, the vibrancy of civil society, the strength of our institutions are all so much stronger than we give them credit for. And they are certainly stronger than anybody who's not American gives them credit for. So this is a bracing test for the country. Um, and I am uh, an unrepentant signatory of all of the anti-Trump letters, and I feel like the president proves us right every single day. Um, but, but no, I am not worried. For well, there's, I mean, there is an interesting paradox. You know, I, I, Trump said what he said about our alliance structures, for example, and um, it was harshly critical. It really sort of said, "What's in this for us?" What um, and uh, at the same time, over the course of the past year or so, I would say senior American officials from the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor, Vice President, uh, have gone around giving speeches about the importance of alliances to US security. And I suppose the President could have stopped that if he had wanted. He might have had some resignations to deal with. 
But the interesting thing is that if you look at, uh, you know, polling now, uh, the Chicago Council survey just found for the first time a majority of Americans were willing to send troops to defend the Baltics against Russian attack. So it's uh, maybe an illustration of, of what I think uh, uh, your buddy, the continental philosopher Hegel, might have called the cunning of history. I love that example. Um... Two things about it. The first, I went back and looked at polling. So everybody's talking about what a disaster President Trump is for alliances. And I personally believe he is driving up the cost to our country of everything we try and do in the world because he's just being rude. And, and he's acting as though there is no cost to being nasty to people who want the same outcomes we want and who put their treasuries and their children at risk to work with us on those things. What the president keeps getting wrong about alliances is that it's the dynamic of America's alliance relationships isn't that other countries come to us and drag us into all of their problems. Actually, the arrow goes the other way. The, the challenge of being an American ally is that we're the ones who always show up in your capital and tell you all the things we need for you to do that you don't want to do. Um, so, so the president's needlessly driving the cost up by being a jerk. But I went back and looked. 28% um, of Europeans uh, uh, support President Trump or, or think the United States is is responsibly running the international order. Um, in the last year of the Bush administration, so not the year of the Iraq invasion, but end of the second term where you had the nicer, kinder, gentler, domesticated George W. Bush administration, 28% of Europeans thought the United States was running the international order well. So again, we should not mythologize the past. The Europeans are always worried that we're reckless. I would like us to be less reckless than this, let me say that, but, but uh, this is not the first time Europeans have worried about American influence. And the most important thing you said was that last point about the Chicago Council. And I, my theory of the case, so the Chicago Council, Todd and I have the pleasure of uh, being part of a, a, what would you call it's it? It's an advisory group. An advisory group. They do an annual uh, survey of American public attitudes every year. And in the past year, they found a huge swing in American public support for three things, alliances, trade, and immigration. 15-point swings in American public attitudes over a course of a year. Swings of a kind that when you're a pollster and you get results like this, you say, what went wrong? Because you don't, it's just yeah. very unusual. My theory of the case of what's happening is that President Trump is asking first order questions. Why do we have trade deals? They don't look like good deals to me. So a majority of the American public now thinks that trade creates greater prosperity for people like them. That, that's a big change. He's asking first order questions like, uh, why don't our allies take care of themselves? Why are they such a burden on us? A majority of Americans think alliances are in our interests. And you've seen a 15-point swing in the space of a year. Ditto on immigration. My theory of what's happening is that the president is that people like me, the establishment, have failed in our responsibility to bring Americans along on those areas. So we have a lot of work to do at Rotary clubs, at you know, all over the country, to to hold hands and respectfully talk to our fellow Americans about why we think and America engaged in the world is such a good thing. But also, my mom's thinking her way through it. And the president has precipitated her pausing to think about these things. And she has come to different conclusions than he has. Right? So, so public attitudes are swinging away from the president's policy prescriptions because the president caused Americans to pause and think about those things for the first time in a while. Let me ask you, uh, how's London treating you? And uh, I, mean, I know you haven't been there that long, but uh, what is to become of our little uh, special relationship? Uh, is the, are the Brits tired of the mythology that they have created around us and uh, prepared to go their own way, or do we have something that's more enduring and deep than that? 
Uh, so I resent Walter Russell Mead for many reasons. Uh, <laughs> one of which is that my friend, my friend Walter Mead stole the best book title of all time, Special Providence, which comes from uh, German Chancellor Bismarck saying in exasperation that God has a special providence for drunks, babies, and the United States of America. And uh, I would have loved to have had that book title, but Walter already had it long ago locked up. Uh, and I think the Anglo-American relationship is actually another example of special providence because Britain is right to be fearful about our rely. Every American ally is right to be fearful about the reliability of the United States. Um, but mostly the United States keeps its allies not because we're a great ally, but because other countries don't have a better choice than us. And Britain right now, having made a choice to exit the European Union, and to exit the European Union in a way that maximizes the exasperation of their continental friends and partners actually doesn't have a whole bunch of better options than us at the moment. So my guess is they're going to play this hand out. Um, and we would be smart to make it easy on them as we play it out. Uh, also, the British, it looks to me like the May government is making a really smart play into the Pacific. That the, the rumor that they're going to volunteer to join the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, that would be a stroke of strategic genius. It would change the conversation. And it would be beneficial to the United States because it would make it easier for us to backtrack and come into the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership and have a US-UK trade deal that dovetails into it. That would actually, they would give us a good way out of a problem of our own making. Um, but, but yeah, it's not, it's a difficult time in the British-American relationship, in part because we are vibrant civil societies that our governments can't really control. So Prime Minister May would like to have President Trump come to Britain and do some bilateral business together. But the mayor of London has made that well nigh impossible because he's more popular than she is. Um, and President Trump behaved disgracefully after the terrorist attacks in London and the, the mayor of London's holding him to account. So I think the relationship is actually quite deep and quite shock resistant because we are civil societies that our governments have to be responsive to and where our reflexes are so similar in so many important ways. But it's going to be rocky because both governments are weak and both governments are making bad choices. How about some questions from you folks? I'd be glad to uh, take one. Um, yeah, please. Uh, microphone's coming. Please wait for it and tell us who you are. Hi, Corey. George Nicholson, Washington liaison with the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. Even though you, you know, I really enjoyed the book, just like I enjoyed your previous book with General Mattis. Thank you. Uh, which a lot of people need to read also. But um, you sort of terminated at the end of World War I. What about emerge other conflicts now with the emphasis on World War II with the British? You know, the two movies, the one on Dunkirk and the one at the mm -hmm. Academy Award the other night. With a conflict that existed, the two paths we could have gone down. If Lord Halifax had been able to force Winston Churchill out, what kind of impact would that have had on the future? And also, the conflict with the uh, that uh, in the Arabs-Israeli War, 1956, where we sided against the British mm -hmm. and French. How disruptive that was, you know, to our special relationship. Yes. Yeah, so. I am super glad I did not know uh, that Harvard has selected as reader number one of my manuscript, Laurie Friedman. And he had recommended that I end with Suez. And because I didn't know it was Laurie, I pushed back and said, that's, you know, the water's already over the dam by that point. But you are in good company in thinking that the ruthlessness of the Eisenhower administration in refusing 
continued bank transfers between the two countries, the upholding of the sterling, if the British proceeded with the Suez invasion, that's a hugely consequential moment. But after that, you also get the Kennedy administration's nuclear negotiations. I mean, this is a relationship that's tumultuous all along the way. It doesn't just, the tumult doesn't end in 56, and it doesn't end in 45 either. What I liked about the World War II case is that, as Todd suggested, Britain plays it as a special relationship, right? The great, mo- the great line by Churchill when he uh, when he's when Roosevelt sees him naked, like Britain has no secrets to keep from the United States. It's so witty. It's so pungent in setting the relationship. But uh, what that glosses over is how strong the arguments were for a Pacific first strategy uh, on the part of the United States. That as late as the summer of 1943, the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of War were both arguing that the British were using American war efforts to sustain their empire, and we ought to cut that tie and and pivot to the Pacific. Um, And uh, it was a much closer run thing. And in particular, when you look at the declaration that Roosevelt and Churchill make at the start of the great special relationship meetings. Um, It is the United States imposing on Britain what the rules of the new order will be, right? Britain didn't support free trade. We were breaking up the imperial preference of their trading system with the Halifax Declaration. Um, We were committing them to self-determination, which again, sowed the seeds of the end of the British Empire. So uh, yes, it was, Uh, a rallying moment, but it was a rallying moment in which America was setting the terms for the order that would come later. And uh, at the Tehran conference, Churchill writes that Britain was a small lion sitting between the great Soviet bear and the American elephant, um, trying to have a voice. Uh, So so it's not that special. Um, But again, both countries have lots of good reasons to be allies. And the civic society that is so strong and so similar in both countries undergirds it in a way it doesn't undergird other relationships. Yes, you're next. The microphone. Hi, Mike Pillsbury of the Hudson Institute. I'm writing a book review of your book, which is Uh very very flattering. Sharpshooter present. It's very flattering, and you're going to blush. I praise your book so much. Yay, lucky me. So here's my question. Your work and your views are of great interest to a lot of Chinese scholars. If you are going to Singapore this year, which I hope you are, I am. I would like to introduce you to a number of the Chinese authors who have gone over the same material but come out differently. I'd love to have that conversation. Um, some of them have published pieces that reveal a debate in China where a number of scholars pretty much agree with you that China really has no chance to um, become the hegemon, replace the United States, and change the rules. Um, but others disagree. I fear the president of China is in this other camp. Right. And he has an awful lot of followers. <laughs> automatically. Um, and a couple of times, I, I, don't th- I think I'll leave this out of the book review, but there is a slight contradiction between the way you present what's in the book and some sentences that are actually in the book. Okay. And, and your blurb on the back, this third guy's name I can't pronounce, he seems to have picked up the same thing I picked up, that there is a possibility of a Chinese world, global, successful hegemony. Oh, yeah. And if so, it won't be peaceful, or it might be a close-run thing, to use your phrase. In the book itself, you several times mention this, that this could happen. You've got an if-then. If China solves its challenges, then it will become the global hegemon. Mm -hmm. But if that's, if I'm correctly reading your book, that's a pretty big uh, red flag 
to the United States for global strategy. Yes. But when you present it verbally, you tend to play down. Oh, the mothers want their safe milk, and you know they can't really succeed us ever. So I hope to. I'm trying to intrigue you in knowing that this debate going on in Beijing, commercial for my book. I try to talk about the debate. They, Wonderful. And you're weighing in on one side, and they're going to love you. They're going to translate your book. They're going to want you to speak all over China. <laughs> But the other side is going to be saying, "No, she doesn't understand China's potential." So I think China has an enormous amount of potential, and I hope they succeed. I I would love to see a China that is broad-shouldered, prosperous, and democratic. I Shaki's theory of the international order is that we don't need to be afraid of countries that are successful. We need to be afraid of countries that aren't successful, right? It's the dead enders that we need to worry about, because a rising powers, in my judgment, are America's natural allies, right? They're brash, they're confident, they're nouveau riche, they're like us in a lot of important ways. We're going to understand them. We're going to find ways that we can work together. I am much less confident. That countries that don't liberalize as they grow more prosperous can either continue to grow sustainably prosperous, or we can find a way to deal with.、Um, and so, since I think it likelier than not that China will have to liberalize if it will continue to rise, that's how I resolve that internal tension.、Um, but. But yeah, there is the possibility that China can succeed in creating a dystopian state where police can tell who's jaywalking and can diminish your ability to get a bank loan if you walk across the street against a red light. Yes. Yeah. That is a possibility. I think it less likely than likely. And in part because I,、um, I think for that to happen, for a dystopian China, they will have to be good at so many things, and we will have to fail at so many things. And I actually think we're more dynamic than the declinist theory gives us credit for. But it's one taxpayer's opinion. <laughs> I think that would be good for everyone, wouldn't it? <laughs> I hope they would take it as an incentive to to liberalize, to realize that the time is run, sand is running through the hourglass if they do not find a way to more accurately represent the desires of their own population. Corey told me as she was coming in that she'd actually, you know, she'd been doing an, a, a panel on was it at APEC earlier today,、uh, and in fact it was running on. And so she、uh, got up and, and left the podium in order to get here.、Um, I'm not prepared to have that happen to me because I, th- I think、We、something would、friends. really be lost. So I do want to、uh, I want to draw this to a close by thanking you. The book is Safe Passage: The Transition from British to American Hegemony. It's got a fantastic period cartoon on the cover of a of a woman in.、Uh, Uh, in uh, uh, Yankee regalia, putting on a battleship hat,、uh, which is、uh, r- which really does kind of kind of capture the moment, and also in certain respects the author.、Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I thank a, you for that well, compliment. I think I,、uh, it was intended only as a compliment, and、uh, I want to thank、uh, all of you for、uh, coming along today. And join me in thanking Corey Shockey. Thank、Tom、you, my、Lindbergh、friends, and, for making、yep. this time for me. I appreciate it. <laughs>